start the stream. Hit the site so we don't have any feedback. Cool. Oh, any new updates to the packet wall project? So I bought a reel of 300 LEDs. And apparently the way to program these suckers is through Python. And um, you know how much I love writing in Python. So after this, I'm, I'll start, um, I'll, I'll continue streaming on, uh, on Twitch. What I need to get is another camera so that you see the lights. What I am doing with them, I am making a network sensor essentially. Infosec urban.info slash blog slash packet wall. That's the site. That's the site of my blog. And specifically this project that I'm working on. My goal is to have as many rules as possible, detecting everything on the network and turning on lights as things are detected or not detected. Had it working with a couple of lights, but as I realized I wanted to go bigger and for example, have rules for every device on my network since my home network doesn't have that many devices to begin with. I could be granular and not just be generic, but I needed more lights. The sharp tap is what is capturing the packets. I don't have a span port on my core switch. And span ports don't always work well. They tend to drop packets every now and then, especially if they get over, if the switch itself gets overwhelmed. So it's better to go with a tap. Yep. That tap sits right between the the LAN of the, of the router and the rest of the network. And I've created a couple rules to get started. And I'm going to be adding more rules. But I need more lights for every rule. It's actually been a fun project. But now I've hit the my weak point, which is uh, programming. So yay. It's fun. It's learning a whole lot. I've been putting stuff on Twitter as I find things. So let's see how far I get today between classes. And speaking of, it is past 11, so let's get rolling. I just realized 
I didn't have any of my sound on. Ha ha. Record to this computer. OK. So here we are in module number seven. Um, word of just a heads up. This chapter is has nothing really in the realms of technical. This chapter is all about the structure of the US legal system, uh, how it works, various laws that apply, and the amendments, and how they, they work in our field. This is, as far as I can see, the one chapter that is very minimal in the realm of technical, but is all about that legal aspect that you need to be familiar with. I know. OK, well, the structure of the US legal system, all cases are tried per the state and the federal laws. We have the jury, a group of people who are put under oath to hear arguments at a trial and render a verdict of guilty or not guilty. The plaintiff is the person who initiates the lawsuit and is responsible for the cost of litigation. The defendant is the person who defends himself in a lawsuit. The US legal system comes from common law that is based on case law and precedent with laws derived from court decisions. Precedent is court decisions that are binding on future decisions in a particular jurisdiction. Therefore, these laws are derived not from legislation, but court decisions. Civil law is based on the Napoleonic code based on Roman law. Civil law is based on scholarly research, which becomes legal code and is enacted by a legislature without precedent. Uh, the three primary bodies of law exist in the US, constitutional law, statutory law, and regulatory. The constitutional or federal outlines relationships between three federal branches while protecting the rights of its citizens. Statutory, is written law from legislature at national, state, or local levels. These are codified or statutes that are organized by subject matter and uncodified laws. Regulatory law governs the activities of government administrative agencies, such as tribunals, commissions, boards, responsible for making decisions that affect the environment, taxation, international trade, immigration, and so forth. Oops. In the US, this is the structure of the court system. The basic structure of federal, state, and local courts is the same. A defendant has the right to a fair trial with the outcome determined by a jury of his peers. The role of the judge is to facilitate the trial process and ensure that the proceedings are in accordance with the law, along with ensuring that the proceedings are free from prejudice and the innocence of the defendant is presumed until proven otherwise. The burden of proof is always on the prosecution. You have the appeals courts. These courts enable its citizens to appeal a conviction, deciding whether to hear an appeal. They are not trials. A panel of judges render a decision whether a mistake occurred in a lower court. Uh, the federal court uh, is one type uh, consisting of the district courts, circuit courts of appeal, and the Supreme Court. They don't have uh, general jurisdiction. And then, of course, we have the Supreme Court, you know, the appointment for life or unless removed by impeachment. Uh, the judiciary branch is the ultimate arbiter of the law, not Congress or the president. Article 2 of the Constitution outlines the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and other federal courts. The federal appellate courts, there are 13 of them, um, one for each of the original states, 12 regional circuit courts, as well as the additional one in DC. Each of these is assigned a circuit justice from the Supreme Court. These courts can refer cases to the Supreme Court with three judges sitting in each of those courts. There are the district courts. There's 94 of them across the US. Every state has at least one. 
most federal cases, the criminal and the civil, begin here. Kidnapping or intellectual property cases are some examples of cases tried at this level. You have the state courts. These vary at each state. Local trial courts are located throughout the state and hear cases at lower levels. If the defendant is found guilty, they can appeal a conviction in a state appellate court. Those are the highest courts in the state judicial system, the appellates. They have discretion over which cases they hear and are often referred cases where there could be an error in determining the law. They are confined to a particular jurisdiction and asked to preside over contentious decisions like elections. There are also the intermediate appellate courts. These exist in 40 out of the 50 states and they have various numbers and judges in each state. These are some trial courts of limited jurisdiction, the probate or the surrogate court, the family for things like child custody, visitation, so forth, traffic, like driving violations, juvenile, small claims, and municipal. In a courtroom, there are a series of steps that have to be done. Everything is, is very scientific. The pretrial and trial steps in a civil or a criminal case are the jury selection, oath and preliminary instructions, opening statements, testimony of witnesses, uh, closing arguments, jury instructions, deliberations, verdict, and sentencing. The jury is outlined in the Sixth Amendment. The, the, the process that a jury is selected is there. Uh, some cases may require the jurors to be sequestered or isolated to prevent external influences on the jury decisions. The opening statements, again, the prosecution goes first since they have the burden of proof and must prove guilty. The defense doesn't have to prove anything. Under the Fifth Amendment, the defendant need not speak ever during the trial, but will have direct examination um, and cross-examinations during the trial. The jury will then deliberate and uh, decide you know, whether guilty or not. A hung jury will occur when the jury cannot come to a unanimous decision and a retrial must occur. This is not necessary in a civil trial. The jury can also decide uh, uh, financial issues in a civil trial. It's the responsibility of the judge to determine the sentence. Criminal charges are initiated by government prosecutors on behalf of the people. The defendant is indicted to stand trial and answer questions relating to serious crimes or provide information. A felony is a serious crime and generally carries a penalty of a year or more in prison. A misdemeanor is a less serious crime with sentence of less than a year. A deposition is a sworn witness testimony taken during the discovery phase or prior to the trial and is generally not taken for criminal cases. Civil cases can be presented with them. A civil case is brought by an individual or an organization referred as a plaintiff against the individual or an organization. Civil trials generally involve disputes over money. If successful, the plaintiff is awarded money by the jury. A civil trial identifies whether an entity failed to act reasonably and prudently under a certain set of circumstances or what's called the preponderance of evidence. Now, constitutional law. The First Amendment. Though this was written long before digital communications, we rely on the Supreme Court and lower federal courts to interpret what protections a person 
posting insulting comments has along with the rights of the victim. Can any opinion, no matter how disturbing, be posted on a blog? There is sometimes a difference between moral responsibility and constitutional law. The Fourth Amendment protects people, not places. One of the issues that arises with the Fourth Amendment is the expectation of privacy. A link clearly exists between unreasonable search and seizures and the expectation of privacy, but the Supreme Court has not always been clear about the linkage, which causes confusions and case law is the best guide for litigators. For example, one gray area of expectation of privacy is the workplace. Do you have privacy at work or not? A few other terms that you'll see under this amendment used in our realm is the exclusionary rule. Evidence seized and examined without a warrant or in violation of individual's rights will often be inadmissible as evidence in a court. The fruit of the poisonous tree, a metaphorical expression to describe evidence that was initially acquired illegally. All evidence subsequently gathered at every point from that initial search is inadmissible in court. Suritorari? I don't actually know how to pronounce that. It's an order made by a higher court that directs a lower court or tribunal to send it court documents related to a case for further review. And motion in Lyman, Lyman, request by a lawyer to hold a hearing before a trial in an effort to suppress evidence. Now this that I have in front of you is a search warrant. Arguably the most important part of the constitution for forensics investigators. Law enforcement must obtain a search warrant, a court order issued by a judge or magistrate authorizing law enforcement to search a person or place as well as seize items or information within the parameters of the warrant before a search can be carried out. Investigators must demonstrate probable cause or conditions under which law enforcement may obtain a warrant for a search or arrest when it is evident that a crime has been committed. Warrants are specific to a particular crime and criminal investigation, specific to a geographical location. For example, if a house borders two counties, two separate warrants are necessary to search the entire property. In one case, law enforcement was issued a warrant to search a house, but the suspect's computer was located in a shed in the back of the house, which was not in the warrant and thus not permitted to be seized. Not all searches re require a search warrant. Since the USA Patriot Act, law enforcement has greater powers, extending warrantless searches when a person's life or safety may be in danger or uh, exigent circumstances. The DOJ has provided guidelines for warrantless searches and seizure of computers. When appropriate consent is granted to a government agent, a warrant is not required. Consent can be granted when an individual waives his or her Fourth Amendment rights. The search is limited to the physical area of the individual's authority and to a specific criminal investigation. A warrantless search is also subject to the totality of circumstances. The individual granting consent must be a sound mind, an adult, and educated with a certain degree of intelligence. Sometimes law enforcement uses the knock and talk. I found this picture hilarious. Without sufficient evidence or they cannot demonstrate probable cause to enter a residence to execute a search, law enforcement can go to the suspect's home and try to obtain the consent of the individual to gain entry into the home and conduct a consensual search. Plain view doctrine allows government agents to seize evidence without a warrant when the officer can clearly observe contraband. 
the officer must be lawfully present in an area protected by the Fourth Amendment. Evidence must be in plain view, and the officer must immediately identify the item as contraband without further intrusion. Search warrants never allow investigators to conduct a general search. A couple more terms that go with this is plain error. Appeals court identifies a major mistake made in court proceedings, even though no objection was made during the initial trial in which judgment was passed and a new trial was ordered. The rules of criminal procedure. These are protocols for how criminal proceedings in a federal court should be conducted. Uh, there is the search incident to lawful arrest, allows law enforcement to conduct a warrantless search after an arrest has been made, and standing a suspect's right to object to a Fourth Amendment search. So here's a question. When does digital surveillance become a search? Stingrays are a generic name for a device that acts like a cell phone tower to locate criminal suspects, but can also locate people in disaster areas like earthquakes. A pen register is an electronic device that captures telephone numbers. These require law enforcement to show that only the information retrieved is likely to assist in an ongoing investigation. Pen registers are not searches. In Smith versus Maryland, the DOJ admitted it conducted a search, but contended that there is no expectation of privacy when using a cell phone. The prosecution stated that a court order did allow investigators to capture real-time data from Verizon. Earlier today, I took a, a, just a quick search for a, a pen register to put in here, and I found this company who has uh, all kinds of tools for law enforcement to do, uh, to do digital surveillance. So I just stuck it here in case you were interested. Hey, how about GPS tracking? GPS tracking devices are prevalent and widespread with their legality in the four. For example, it is not illegal for law enforcement to attach a GPS tracker if the area doesn't pass the done test for curtilage and enclosed intimate space. Here's a quote from one of the cases, US versus Knotts. Monitoring signals on these devices does not invade any legitimate expectation of privacy on the respondent's part. And thus there was neither a search nor a seizure within contemplation of the Fourth Amendment. The surveillance amounted principally to following an automobile on public streets and highways. A person traveling in an automotive on an automobile on public thoroughfares has no reasonable expectation of privacy in his movements. Here's another quote that I found interesting from U.S. versus McIver. The undercarriage is part of a car's exterior and as such is not afforded a reasonable expectation of privacy. Now I found those to be Interesting. So you're telling me, you're telling me that if my house has a fence and a gate and the fence is closed, then law enforcement cannot set foot on my property to stick a GPS on the undercarriage of the car because that fails the done test for curtilage. But if I have a home and my driveway is open, Law enforcement can walk up and stick a GPS under the car. That, that kind of blew my mind, actually. But yeah, that, that was um, yeah, interesting. Um, you probably couldn't because you're not law enforcement. I don't know about private citizens doing that to cars. I don't know that. Um, but interesting that, interesting mindset. I didn't think about, I, I didn't realize that 
uh, being on the road just means you don't expect privacy. You have no reasonable expectation of privacy in your movements when you are driving. You, it is totally legal to be followed by law enforcement. I don't know, food for thought. Traffic stops. In the case of Riley versus California, which happened in 2014, the US Supreme Court ruled that police require a warrant to search the cell phone of someone who is arrested. This was a landmark decision for law enforcement and forensic investigators because the cell phone can no longer be searched um, in a, uh, during an arrest. So if you get stopped by the cop, they can't ask for your phone and start searching through it. That's a, that requires a warrant. The Fifth Amendment protects the individual from self-incrimination. That's what it means when someone says, I plead the Fifth. A defendant is not compelled to testify at a trial and may plead the Fifth. An indictment is a charge delivered by a grand jury stating that the accused must stand trial. Investigators must be sure to have gathered all the necessary evidence before the case goes to trial. The Fifth Amendment can influence the outcome of computer forensics investigations. For example, forcing a defendant to supply a password is forcing the defendant to provide testimony because the defendant is conveying his knowledge, a known PIN or password, to access files with an incriminating device. Conversely, the suspect can be forced to use his finger to unlock a laptop or smartphone Biometric access is not protected by the Constitution. So let me reiterate that. If you have a touch ID, if you have face ID, anything like that, law enforcement can legally force you to unlock that device. So I would say, I would go as far as saying, in a company, it should be fine to use biometrics to log in. But when it comes to personal devices, do not use biometrics. If you, you know, if you get caught and arrested and, and they want to open the thing, they can do so if you have things like face ID and touch ID and all that. Well, a YubiKey is a physical object. So I would think Probably. I would think the answer is probably just like if they arrest you, they can use the keys of your car to open the trunk. But see, th that's where two factor authentication comes in. Because even if they have the UB key, if you have a password, then they can't get, they can't access that account or accounts. Now I am no law expert in any stretch of the mind, but that is, but that makes sense. Now some legislation. There is the Federal Wire Type Wire Tap Act. This law states that law enforcement is prohibited from using wiretap without a judge's permission. 
A wiretap has to be authorized by the Justice Department, signed off by a U.S. District Court or Court of Appeals judge, and valid for 30 days. Under this law, service carriers may on occasion monitor and intercept communications to combat fraud and theft of services. This law was amended in 1986 by the Electronic Communications Privacy Act to include transmissions from a computer. The Stored Communications Act says there are no Fourth Amendment protections when using an ISP or an email provider. Stored communications are defined as any temporary intermediate storage of a wire or electronic communication incidental to the electronic transmission thereof, and any storage of such communication by an electronic communication service for purposes of backup protection of such communication. Applying SCA is problematic since law enforcement operating in one's jurisdiction is granted a search warrant, but a service provider is he headquartered elsewhere with the actual service in another location. Uh, through rulings based on this law, there should be a diminished expectation of digital privacy in the workplace. FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It outlines procedures by which electronic surveillance may be carried out to protect the U.S. from international espionage. This act was amended by the USA Patriot Act to include terrorism, which may or may not be state-sponsored. The use of pen registers and tap and trace devices in foreign intelligence investigations is listed in this law. Uh, there's a lot of uh, ISPs who don't allow their customers to run their own SMTP servers. Even cloud providers don't allow that. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. It invokes stiff penalties for those found guilty of unauthorized access to a network. Section 814 of the Patriot Act made several amendments like increasing the maximum penalty to hackers who damage computers to 20 years in prison, include intent to damage a computer rather than type of damage, a new offense for damaging computers used in national security or criminal justice. Uh, there is a portion of the corporate espionage law in your lecture notes. along with a few others that are important in that realm. We have the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act. Telecom companies are forced to redesign their infrastructure to meet compliance with this law. VoIP operators are not subject to this and might not be able to assist law enforcement with investigations since VoIP has no switches on a network and therefore provides serious technological challenges using a wiretap. Um, yes, yes, this is why it is important that when you do a penetration test, you stay within scope because, because of that law, you could go to prison for 20 years. The USA Patriot Act provides greater power to law enforcement to prevent terrorist attacks from reoccurring. Law enforcement can conduct surveillance without judicial approval in certain circumstances. This law has impacted digital forensics, for example. If law enforcement receives an email from someone who's been kidnapped, then they can act without the use of a warrant because someone's life is in danger. In the lecture notes, I have uh, outlined a couple of the sections, like section 202, the authority to intercept voice communications and computer hacking investigation. 209, voice messages, um, voicemails, are no longer protected by the Fourth Amendment. 210, subpoenas can include records of session times and durations any temporarily assigned network addresses, obtain credit card bank information of internet users. 
It compels ISPs to provide complete details about incidents. 213 is called the sneak and peek warrant provision. Search a home or business hastily without notifying the target in advance. Prevents criminal suspects from tipping off other criminals about an imminent search. 216 extends pen registers and trap and trace statute to non-content information to the internet to include IP addresses, MAC addresses, port numbers, and user accounts. Section 217, an individual victim of unauthorized access by a hacker can allow law enforcement to, in to intercept the communications of the trespasser. It has to meet four conditions. The owner or user of a protected computer must authorize the interception. The person who intercepts the communication must be lawfully engaged in the ongoing investigation. Reasonable grounds to believe that the interception of a communication will assist in the ongoing investigation, investigators must only intercept the communication of the trespasser. Um, yes, if you have 911 texting and you say you need help, law enforcement can uh, go in without the need of a warrant. Thanks to the USA Patriot Act. Protect, it provides a greater protection for children against abuse, eliminates waiting periods for law enforcement to begin investigation of missing people 18 to 21, eliminates statutes for uh, limitations for child abuse and kidnappings and prohibits computer generated child porn. The DCMA, there are four titles to it the world, Title I is the, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Title II, the Online Copyright Infringement Liability Limitation Act. <clears throat> Title III, Computer Maintenance Competition Assurance. And Title IV, six miscellaneous, it has six miscellaneous ones that cover everything from ephemeral recordings, webcasting, uh, bargaining agreements, and so on. Oh, there's also cloud, the Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data Act. It obliges US-based tech corporations to allow federal law enforcement to obtain data stored on servers domestically and internationally with a subpoena or a warrant. Hasn't been ratified by countries like the EU yet. Expert witnesses. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, before I, that is the rules of the evidence and visibility. Sorry, I jumped ahead. There are a couple of tests, like the Fry and the Daubert test. As you can see, the, the Fry is based on Fry versus US. Expert opinion must be derived from a thing and must be based on science that is demonstrable and not experimental. The Daubert test. Uh, based on another court of Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals, computer forensic investigators must perform benchmark testing on their hardware and software tools. This testing will enable the investigator to explain known error rates. Now, expert witnesses. Testimony that is not firsthand is hearsay unless uh, it is digital evidence allowing an expert witness to provide his opinion during a trial or deposition. Both defense and prosecution can use their own expert witnesses and cross-examine the opponent's expert. The goal of the defense is always to discredit the expert testimony, evidence, tools, and scientific methodology. There are federal rules of civil procedure that apply uh, to civil cases with expert witnesses. They must provide a written report to the trial, disclose an uh, important part of the discovery. They have Their reports must have all kinds of things like the facts, complete statements, witnesses, qualifications, all the stuff that we talked about earlier in another module.
There's also the best evidence rule. The secondary evidence or a copy is inadmissible in court when the original exists. This rule is exempt for digital evidence. And then a quick look at the EU, China, and India. Uh, most of uh, the legal system in Europe is based on the Roman law of people, property, and, uh, yeah, Roman law, people, property, and acquiring property. The EU has 27 countries in the dual legal system. Each country has its own laws and then the EU law. Of course, for us, the big thing that we know the EU for is GDPR, which makes a distinction between personal and sensitive data, makes a distinction between data controller and data processor, also uh, makes GDPR or makes investigations attorney directed. The incident responder may have to seek advice from a cyber legal attorney, country legal, and the company's data protection officer during the investigation, along with a series of questions that have to be answered. If a US company has an employee in Spain whose laptop was stolen, it would be problematic to check if the, la if the laptop was compliant, like say encrypted. The local and GDPR legislation impact whether the investigation must take place in the country, Spain, whether the data can be transferred back to the US and permission sought from the employee to investigate a laptop owned by the company. Uh, China is, has the greatest restrictions on internet content, you know, the great, uh, the great firewall. And the government closely monitors the contents of its citizens and what they view. India brought in a law in 2011. The information technology rules of 2011, which protect the privacy of online consumers. And it's important to know that this legislation impacts US companies that outsource services to India. It has a couple of primary tenants, privacy policies, consent, consumer access and editing, transfer personal data and security. Hope that wasn't too terrible. Any other questions as I look at all three chats? I put a bunch of cases and more information in the lecture notes so you can continue digging further. You should have some knowledge of these things, but you're not expected to be, you know, attorney level that you know it all. But it is an interesting topic. So I'll make this to a recording and then I'll make the short recording of the activities for this week. Uh, and then Python. Okay. Yeah, I want to keep working on my lights. But I have to rewrite my entire light section in Python.
Oh, that video took a little longer to make than I thought. Oh yeah, it's almost time for NCL. That's right. Okay, let's make a new share for this one. And hit record on the screen. Okie dokie. So the work this week, we are in module seven. One week away from spring break. Woo. Two things are on your to-do list. Number one is completing at least four digital forensic related rooms in Try Hack Me, such as incident response. If you can't, if these rooms for whatever reason are not available anymore, it's okay. Just search for other rooms under digital forensics and show proof that you completed the room. Case number three is different from the prior. This is not a quiz anymore. We are moving closer to the actual cases. So in this case, you have the, you have the story, you have the target systems and devices, you have the SHA-1s, and you have 59 questions to answer. You will submit that as a PDF. As always, you do not need to work all by yourself. You can work with others. I do not expect I, I am not expecting anybody to work on their own. Uh, you can if you want, but you have everything you need from the story to the systems, to the Shahs and all the questions that need to be answered. If you need, if you get stuck on anything, ask your classmates for help or you know, yeah, I'll see it in the chat, in the Discord chat and answer, um, you know, help, you, help you out through it. Are there any questions? As you see, we're going away from a completely structured setup to moving, moving more away from that into giving you the, the space to start creating your own report. Because once we hit uh, week nine and forward, when you have the cases, you'll just be presented with the story and the hashes and then you'll need to to write a report to uh you know to answer the whatever the, the scenario is asking for any questions Okie dokie. And with that, I will end the recording.